Okay, one housekeeping uh, information. Uh, tomorrow we will have uh, some sort of karaoke singing too. So those people who are interested in that should make up a list of songs that they would like to have played so that the disc jockey can prepare for this. So all of the karaoke fans and great singers that we have among the people here, they should just make a list, this song, that song, and so forth, and then things will work out fine, I'm sure. Um, as far as the rules of question and answer session goes, um, you can ask, address individuals on the panel, you can address the panel as a whole, and all the panelists can comment on each other as well. And please wait always until the microphone arrives at your place before you ask your questions. You can ask whatever you want, whatever you wanted to know about sex or money or so. These are, these are our competent uh, people. All right. So Jay will carry the microphone, point out that you are one of the questioners, and then he will arrive at you. Professor Gabb, thank you for your presentation. I spoke with you briefly uh, during the break about this, but for people that are very interested in the private production of security and defense, you made mention of how outsourcing the Navy actually created a problem for the existence of the empire, and I was wondering if you had any further thoughts about that dynamic. Oh, thank you. It, it is a problem when you outsource the, what, what are called the core functions of the state, or it is a problem whenever you, re well, it is a problem whenever you rely on somebody apart from yourself to manage defense. What we do is either we outsource our defense to the state or the state takes away from us the right to our defense and exercises it for us. And equally, if a state decides to outsource its defense, you are putting yourselves into the hands of some people who may have their own interests or who will have their own interests and those interests may not be entirely aligned with your own interests. The Byzantine state believed that if it outsourced its naval support to a rival power, or to a foreign power, to Venice, then it would receive exactly what it wanted and neither more nor less, and it got a great deal more than it expected. I, I don't think this is a problem with the outsourcing by a state of some aspects of defense. It's a, a universal problem whenever you rely on somebody else who is not yourself for your defense. You are, in a sense, uh, gambling that the interests of yourself and of your defender will always be aligned. The rather effete, the rather useless Byzantine ruling class of the late 11th century never really th thought that the Venetians would have an alternative interest from their own. A, a degree of vanity, a, a degree of vanity which you often see with individuals. Um, a question for Andreas uh, regarding guns. Are there any historical examples you're aware of where the government uh, demanded uh, citizens surrender their weapons and they refused? Can you please repeat that? <coughs> Are you aware of any historical situations where the government uh, demanded citizens uh, surrender their weapons and they refused? Okay. Uh, as far as I know, there have been in the last uh, few years some attempts, of, of especially, uh, for instance, in New Zealand, uh, to, uh, to buy back uh, semi-automatic uh, guns after this event uh, when uh, some Muslims have been killed uh, by, with a, by a maniac. 
And uh, as far as I know, it has been successful. A lot of people gave back their weapons. But in fact, I, I doubt that you really can uh, increase the security by buying back some special weapons. I think in Canada, a, a similar program has, uh, has been run. But I do not know about any uh, details and, and what effect this kind of, 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 of gathering weapons uh, had. So, as far as I know, not in the last time. Uh, I cannot uh, imagine what would have uh, been done by the American citizens when, for instance, in the 19th century, any president would have come up with a program to, to take away their weapons. So I think that could have been uh, causing a revolution because uh, the Americans have another side on their property and especially on their weapons as the Europeans have. Uh, but in Austria, as far as I know, uh, there has been a, a 40 years ago or so, or 30 years ago, uh, when they uh, forbid, uh, for, for, uh, forbade uh, the um, uh, um, special kind of weapons, uh, these pump gun, uh, pump gun shotguns. Uh, the the, the uh, dealers uh, said uh, that Approximately 40,000 of these uh, weapons have been sold until that, uh, that uh, point of time. And just 10,000 have been given back or uh, the people uh, like me demanded a special permit. And uh, that means that at least 30,000 of these weapons uh, are illegal, Ill illegal now. And uh, I think no, uh, no, not a single crime has been perpetrated with these uh, now illegal weapons. But uh, to, to answer the question, the people did not really give a lot of resistance. They just kept it and kept secret. So they did not tell anybody that they own such a gun. Uh, also a question for Andreas Turgel or anyone else who'd like to answer. Um, will the 3D printing of guns or the ability for citizens to make their own guns with new technology, is that likely to change anything? I can do it in German. Ich, also auf Deutsch war die Frage, glaube ich, ob die Möglichkeit, dass Leute ihre eigenen Waffen machen, ähm, ob das irgendwie was verändern könnte. So there is of course the possibility to produce your own weapons uh, as, as soon as you, as you have the equipment. Nobody can uh, can prohibit can can uh, hinder you that uh, that you produce it, but. Uh, it's not not uh, not uh, a big problem to get real guns available on the black market. Uh, Austria is located very close to the balcony, and three years ago there has been a perpetrator who killed some people in the in the inner city of Vienna, and he got an AK-47 from the balcony without any problem, and the ammunition. So I think it's not worthwhile to do a lot of effort to create your own weapon because you can buy whatever you want if, if you just look around and, and, and get the connections. Uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Model. Um, I was wondering, because you said that there was a lot of, obviously, neglect of the psychological aspects of governing people as such by the government, and then somehow they switched to now use exactly the, the human psyche, talking about fear during uh, COVID. Um, do you think one could argue that, in fact, they use the psychological um, or the psyche of the individuals all the time by talking about being altruistic or by talking about uh, having to help each other and being, as you mentioned yourself, you know, using the solidarity uh, curse word as such uh, um, towards uh, the individuals, uh, maybe even just talking about Switzerland. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, 
it has a, a certain dramaturgy in my speech to, let's say, uh, show the tipping point between ignoring and overstressing. And, and I can only agree to, to what you say. In a way, it, it really shows how there is a lack of line. Uh, the whole policy is full of contradiction. And the moralization, for example, is not really, uh, I mean, it's not a heartfelt thing. Uh, basically, because uh, this being I tried to describe has no heart. Um, and the more we should not listen to the moral arguments because they are fake. And um, what is interesting, or my point, is to see in the process of time a certain degeneration and a certain acceleration at the same time. And my wife just told me, I, I haven't given you, so to speak, my, <laughs> my uh, point of the forecast. I thought I did say, but I didn't elaborate on that. And maybe just one sentence, um, saying that within the next three to five years, what we see, um, I think we will see a um, falling apart of institutions. Uh, of course, you can say we already see it. If, if you observe it closely, we see a falling apart of institutions. And that is quite dramatic. And I think you can now do your own forecasts regarding what kind of institutions and um, and where it starts first. I think a very interesting phenomenon is the United States. Um, there are people who are more, uh, yeah, in the, um, in the Anglo-Saxon uh, world, world specialist, but what I see is we have there at least an open civil war, and uh, we have an abuse of institutions. And that is very interesting, and uh, it could, again be the leader of what is happening in Europe uh, for the next coming years. Just, um, I'd like to add to that thought um, uh, that if institutions break down, and they're likely to break down, that is a chance for others to go into that vacuum because the institutions are there for a reason. They've grown over long history and were then uh, captured by the state and so when they break down, when they break apart, when they disappear, that is then a time for um, people who are aware and uh, know that what's happening to build these institutions or, or replacement of these institutions from the ground up. Following up, Robert, thank you for your speech. And you mentioned at the outset about the aspect of being ingrained in our nature, that when you withdraw from one covenant, you immediately seek another. Can you elaborate on the ingrained in our nature aspect? OK. Um, in, in, in terms of how North would say that, we're made that way. Yeah, so we're created that way, that um, we recognize or we, we need a sovereign, we, we look for authority, our, our actions have to be, at, well, because we're imperfect, we need some guidance through the laws and the sanctions belong to that like two sides of a coin. And we have an outlook. We, we, we always think, well, not always, but we, we are working, we're thinking about the future. We think, what, what are our plans? So it, um, I'm, I'm simply observing that. It's not some, I'm, I'm not um, uh, founding this on any other philosophy. It's just an observation that this appears to be ingrained in us. And so the only way to get away from one sovereign is to find another. 
And as I then explained, well, if you think you ha don't have one, you're, you're think, you think yourself is, you are the sovereign of your own making and ignore everything else that other people are saying, are doing, uh, or, or think um, you can rule yourself. And, well, that's probably an error. <laughs> it looks like it, at least. A question for Doug. Do you think there exist also movements that did not turn into rackets? Sorry. What's that? If you talked about how movements are turned into rackets. So are there also movements that did not turn into rackets? Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Hoppe. Um, no, it's, it's hard to imagine, uh, uh, even with the best intentions, uh, you need angels um, who are running these organizations. Um, and, uh, uh, there, there was a wise man who once uh, told me, uh, for instance, uh, uh, no tank, no think. And um, in other words, if you want to think tank, then, uh, uh, you know, if you want anybody to do any thinking, then you have to go raise the money to, to do it. But then the, the money becomes the sole, uh, the sole mission. Um, and again, it's not altogether too different than the than the private private sector. Probably the private sector is uh, since you are providing a service or a good, where people pay directly for that good, then that is not a scam. Uh, whereas in the nonprofit sector, in the political sector, you raise money from one group of people and give it to another, and give the service uh, or the funds to another group of people. And that's always the issue uh, with nonprofits in, in general. Your, your customers are not the same as the donors. You have one group of people who give you the money and another group of people who, who um, use those uh, resources. So um, I think it is only in the, um, only in the uh, um, private capitalist society that, uh, um, you know, a movement or a need for a good um, is a case where it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't turn into a scam. So what that means, the PFS is not a, a racket, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 but, 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 but only to be used for other conferences where the same people come who give the money. So in that sense, I, we do exactly what private business does. The, the, con the, the, the consumers are the payers. That's correct. In the case of PFS, if that's what you're referring to. So and that, that means we are angels. <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, yes. Uh, and I, I had assumed that's what you would have, you know, taken that from my comment. <laughs> 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 yes, uh, the doctors Hoppe are angels, and they they take the money. They only reach out for your funds when they have a uh, a fabulous product to provide you, and uh, it's not uh, not a situation where um, uh, Hans and Golchen are constructing pyramids, so to speak. Um, in downtown Istanbul or here in Bodrum uh, for um, uh, underemployed uh, uh, academics to stand around and do deep thinking. Um, 
we uh, we are offered something. We uh, provide funds uh, uh, willingly, and uh, we come and uh, enjoy the, uh, the the fruits of that. And uh, uh, as 16 years has proven. Uh, that good is uh, well worth it, and is certainly not a scam. And it wouldn't have it wouldn't have lasted 16 years, and hopefully 16 more, or 32 more, or 48 more, or uh, how long are you going to live since you're an angel? I haven't decided yet. Oh, yeah, you know, okay. Um, I have a question for um, uh, Daniel Model and Dr. Gretzinger. Uh, both your speeches made me, reminded me of a famous speech of Jesus Huerta de Soto, God is Libertarian, and he made a very funny parallel uh, between the story of Samuel, the biblical story, the one who was the first giver of the first king to, the, to Israel, the king Saul, and the temptations of Christ, and uh, at the end, the devil says to Christ, I will lay all the governments of the world on your feet if you accept to serve me. And so Huerta de Soto concludes that uh, governments are the incarnations of the devil on earth. And this reminded me of your conclusion that what we would look into the eyes is too ugly to look. And it reminded me of the idea of the devil. So I would like a comment on this from, from both of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the Samuel story is um, uh, interesting in that uh, before then, the uh, Israelites had no king and they wanted a king because the others had a king. It isn't quite clear why, but that's the reason they give. And um, Samuel warns them and says, the king will be dreadful. He will take taxes. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. He will take taxes. He will take, believe that, 10%. Yeah, ten percent of your income, and um, uh, so. But they go ahead anyway. And um, in that in that passage, God says to Samuel, "Yeah, let them let them go ahead. They'll see what they'll get from that." And um, it it seems that um, what he says it means it, there won't be any turning back from that. There won't be any going back to a phase without kings. Uh, now, with the temptation of Christ, um, yeah. Uh, um, I'll, I'll quote from memory north he says um, it's not he doesn't he doesn't think that uh, that means that the governments are in essentially and always from the devil but because the devil is a liar he's saying I'll give them to you but he it wasn't his to give he, sa he says the governments are still from God yeah from Samuel from Samuel's time yeah, um, um, God has permitted or allowed that to happen, and um, uh, as a kind of way of disciplining and punishing um, uh, people who are uh, well, who 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 want a king really, yeah, uh, and don't want God as their king. Yeah. Uh, but it seems from Samuel's time that he said. Okay, like he said that after the flood, that's not going to happen again. In the case of Samuel, he says, well, if you want kings, you're going to have kings forever, oh, until the end of time. Well, first of all, it's nice to, to have some kind of confirmation by people you don't know. Uh, I would say uh, governments are also a hierarchical, uh, hierarchic uh, structure than, for example, in companies. So here again, I, I would make, first of all, a big difference again uh, in another context, uh, like, like uh, Doug French said, in the private sector, you have leadership that is incentivized to continue uh, and and actually accumulate capital and the accumulation of capital is is uh, a picture for developing for increasing for wealth creation and so on 
So there is a possibility, obviously, and a, an ability, I would even say, in the human being to be able to do that. Now, you, of course, then on the government side, you have this evil influence by, okay, power corrupts, but uh, we, we also know big CEOs of big companies are also under the influence of, of corruption. Now, that is why we have the next evil step is, of course, the collaboration between big companies and big governments. You see, that is, that is not by coincidence. It's a, a kind of a logic behind it, because they are both corrupted and impressed by their big power. So there you could, uh, we, we could go into the question, how can we develop as a human being that we are one day not corrupted by power? So that is, that is one, I, I think, very interesting and, and, and also kind of spiritual question, of course. How can you, be powerful, I mean this inner or outer authority question. And the second element that is particularly dangerous for government is this damn monopoly situation, which is not true for most of the companies. So there the big CEOs are a bit in a, in a better situation. So from a spiritual point of view, I would say, my dear, if, if in this room are people working for the government and not being corrupted by that power, I'm really full of respect for that person. Tim, I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, so we have two corruptive powers, power and monopoly situation. And so that's why my criticism is never personally. I, I would never recommend my, my son, even if, I mean, if he asks me, hey, dad, I'm considering a criminal career, uh, and I would ask public or private sector, I, <laughs> I, would, I would actually uh, recommend him the private sector. <laughs> because, because there is a bit less of corruption in, in that career. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to ask a question to Sean. Uh, you talked about the outsourcing of the problems with outsourcing of national defense. And uh, uh, to use a more contemporary example, uh, since the Second World War, basically uh, the entire NATO architecture was outsourcing naval power, for example, to the Americans. Um, and perhaps we're seeing now a misalignment between some of the NATO members' own national interests with the American national interests, or whoever holds the power levers in, in America. So what do you see happening when, in, in modern day terms, when a country's leadership, who is part of an alliance who effectively outsources its national defense to another country, feels that their own national interest is no longer aligned, how would they correct it? Uh, especially if they are a, uh, a small state, say Hungary, or they could be a bigger state like Germany. Um, that's, that's the first question. The second question is to Daniel um, about the, uh, the psyche of governmental actions. Uh, could there be a silver lining in the entire COVID pandemic whereby all the institutions hijacked by the government uh, say the, the media or the so-called medical expert class, the public health expert class, they now have destroyed the credibility so that the people will be less susceptible to have their psyche changed by the, by the government, or well, at least non-coercive government actions. I was just wondering. Well, thank you. If the, if the government of Costa Rica outsources its naval defense to the United States, it can probably rely on the Americans to provide such naval defense as may be required because any hostile power which will try to take over Costa Rica will be a threat to the United States. 
But the wider problem with NATO has existed since its very beginning. The Americans placed the whole of Western Europe under its so-called nuclear umbrella, but everybody knew perfectly well that if the Russians, if the Soviets rather, were to invade, shall we say, West Germany and then to proceed any further into Western Europe, would the Americans seriously consider a nuclear wipeout of the continental United States in order to protect Germany or Western Europe from being invaded? And the answer was, well, we never had to find out the answer to that question, but the answer would probably have been that the Americans would negotiate. And so if you outsource your defense to another power, you, you need to ask yourself, what is the likely interest of that power if we ever need to call on that guarantee or if the other power does provide that defense in certain circumstances, what is the particular agenda of that, of that other country? Um, it's a universal problem and uh, as I said to Tim, if we live in an anarcho-capitalist society, and you outsource your defense to a private company, well, for most purposes, that company will have an interest in a competitive market to provide the contracted defense. But there is no necessary alignment between your interests and the interests of your defender. And this is something we see everywhere. We see it in trusteeship arrangements for children. We see it uh, you, you see it in almost every situation where one person or one institution is given or undertakes an obligation to defend somebody else. Indeed, that's the whole foundation of trust law, as far as I can tell. So, so the problem faced by the Byzantine state in the, in the 11th and 12th centuries is by no means unique. It's just that the, as I said, the Byzantine ruling class preferred to risk giving its naval defense to the Republic of Venice rather than undertake the very unwelcome task of rebuilding its own naval power because that would raise an internal interest which might be hostile to the actions of the central government. It's just something that happens. Yeah, I will not comment on this. <laughs> um, yeah, certainly, I mean, if the question was if they have lost credibility by th these measures, uh, the, the governments, they definitely did. And, and uh, so one example is in, in Germany, we have this famous health minister who, who is really insisting on, on COVID and uh, on wearing masks and all that. And he was about, I think he already did buy millions of vaccine doses. And, uh, and I think it's an easy forecast that they will not be used and at the end of the day will be thrown away if not sent to somewhere else uh, after expiry. They, um, so yes, credibility is lost. And in a way that is, is also good news, you could say. Um, well, if I, I was a government consultant, yeah, funny, <coughs> I, I would recommend to go into learning and, and regain credibility, because that is basically what, what you normally do when you lost credibility. But I think, as, as I, I think in my model, I mentioned monopoly tend to create their own illusions or, or own, um, how do you call that, these blasen, uh, yeah. Bubbles. bubbles, yeah, exactly. They, they live in their own bubbles and, bec and, and I see the psychological element of it as well. I just mentioned um, to you, I think, um, in, in the lunchtime, because she's a customer of mine. And I also uh, am in the danger of living in a bubble, because as, as a CEO, you have a very biased uh, information stream. 
and you actually have to create your own methods to not live in the bubble. That's, that's the most difficult thing, actually. Uh, because, yeah, you know, this hierarchical um, uh, filtering of information and so on, basically the tragedy of every hierarchy is, is uh, that the, the guy on top with the most power is the most stupid person. I mean, not stupid maybe in intellectual terms, but stupid in, in, in the sense of information, lack of information, wrong information. Now, I start usually my meetings with that statement. They stopped laughing about it because the joke has wearing out a bit, <laughs> but they know that at least that I am aware. So I cre try to create almost desperately a, a culture or an atmosphere of bring the problems on the table. Now, because I want the well-being of my company and everybody believes me that this is my interest. And that's of course a, a different story in governmental positions. The, there you have other interests. And that's why, I mean, basically I would, I would uh, consult uh, these, these governments to, to let go their monopoly situations and to create an atmosphere where the facts and figures come on the table. Now concerning COVID, we all know that the cheating of the figures and facts is amazing. I mean, that's new record highs. Uh, and there is an unbelievable fight for these facts and, and to get it. So almost everybody no, now knows that the figures are either not correct or uh, have to be second proofed or, or and so on. So um, I would say we are learning a bit even, even in the bad news, this loss of credibility has increased the debate and now the, the legal uh, working out of all this, I mean, it's a, it was a criminal act against civilization. Now, how, how do you work on this? And the, the, the courts are full of cases already and they, they are working on Samuel Clark and, and so on. So for me, the, a, a very decisive question now in the observation of what's going on is how is this legally digested? That's a key question. If, if it's okay and, it, and there are responsibilities and so on and consequences, my forecasts of three to five years tumbling down of institutions, I would have to prolong but I'm afraid I don't think I have to. Sean, you promised that you would say something about the peril with Trump, uh, and you uh, didn't deliver on the promise yet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't deliver. No one historical event is a perfect analogy of another. And you could try to compare the Venetians with multinational corporations, which seemed a good idea in the early age of globalization, and you could compare, well, you could try aligning the various actors in Byzantine history with the various actors in our own time. Uh, I suppose the the best alignment would be between President Trump and Andronicus. And here it's rather depressing. Donald Trump failed because he never understood the nature of political power. He surrounded himself with completely worthless, and indeed hostile servants who did their very best to frustrate his wishes. He seems to have believed that simply winning the election in 2016 was the revolution, where it was simply a green light from the people to begin a revolution at the top. He did not shut down all of the hostile institutions. He did not put his own people in charge of the remaining institutions. He did none of the institutional trench warfare that would be needed to keep his promise of drain, draining the swamp. 
On the other hand, the emperor Andronicus was ruthless. He did purge the institutions. He tried to clamp down on corruption within the bureaucracy. He tried to reduce the size of the bureaucracy. He tried to stop the nobles from appropriating the land of the peasants. He took a very hard line with what you could call the multinational corporations of the day. He oversaw a massacre of about 60,000 Italian merchants in Constantinople. And still, he failed as well. And so I suppose the overall lesson could be that when a civilization sets itself on a crash landing, there's not much you can do to change course after a certain point. It may be a rather depressing conclusion. Um, a bit obliquely to that, um, but related, uh, I was struck by what um, Andreas Turgel told us about Machiavelli in that regard, because it tied up with what uh, Sean had said. Uh, Machiavelli, if I understood you right, uh, Andreas, uh, uh, giving pe uh, he, sh uh, he said um, um, the leader, the prince, should give the people uh, arms, and because that would endear uh, the, uh, the, the prince to the people. So basically that describes a populist, doesn't it? And it is what um, Andronicus did. Um, so he, he made himself popular as a, a, a he, yeah. And um, uh, uh, I, I was surprised by that because for me Machiavelli was always the baddie. Um, and um, he, here he gives some interesting advice that um, um, would weaken the, the, the bureaucracy and, and, um, and the other institutions of the state, um, just as an oblique uh, point to that. Something I didn't mention earlier was that Andronicus also oversaw a realignment of Byzantine foreign policy. Uh, part, of the, part of the diagnosis of Andronicus was that the Byzantine state had aligned itself unwittingly to what was turning out to be a vastly more powerful civilization and that if the Westerners wanted something, they would always be able to get it. And Byzantine society at the top was entirely permeated by Westerners, quite often princesses from the Crusader states, or sometimes, in case of Andronicus himself, he was married to the very young 12-year-old daughter of the King of France. And part of the Andronicus revolution was to realign the pattern of Byzantine alliances away from the West, which was too large and too powerful to be trusted and controlled, and towards his Islamic neighbors. He sought a, a, much, he, he sought a much better modus vivendi with the Turks, for example, and he saw his own empire as part of a general Near Eastern civilization in which Byzantine Greeks had far more in common with their Islamic neighbors than they had with their co-religionists from the West. And he seems to have started a trend in Byzantine thinking that would end with the statement, better the Sultan's turban in Constantinople than the Cardinal's hat. Uh, the Greeks seem to have made their decision in, in that respect. But, um, 